Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oasis Church at Home. How good is it to see you all? You know, I really want you to have a pen, some paper, and your Bible, because God wants to speak. And when he does, you can't hold that thought in your head. You've got to jot it down, and then you can keep on listening to Pastor Gray. So, let's go. It's time to talk about Jesus. Are you ready? Through Jesus' death and resurrection, he has won the victory over death. The victory over death is eternal life. Eternal life began when you gave up living your own way and decided to follow Jesus. We are already experiencing eternal life. So what is eternal life? What does that really mean? The Gospel of John says eternal life is to know God and to know Jesus Christ whom he sent. So we are already on this journey and church, this lockdown season is the perfect time to get to know God more, a little bit more, a little bit more and a little bit more. We have slowed down. Are you sensing him? We have slowed down. Are you seeing his beauty? We have slowed down. Are you finding him in his word? Are you starting to recognise how he speaks to you? Church, eternal life is now. Jesus has won the victory for us to know God. A little more. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only real and true God and he wants to be known. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you want to be known. Thank you that you have gone to extreme lengths to let yourself be known for us to find you. Thank you, Jesus, for laying down your life that we may have eternal life, knowing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We bless you, Lord. Let's eat and drink together. <coughs> Church, it's now time to pray. And this prayer is a prayer of faith. We pray it by faith. We stand on the word of God and we stand in faith. And sure, there's things happening in our community that we don't want, but we pray this prayer by faith to see God work. So let's stand in faith together as one as we declare this over our Glenanus Severn Shire. Heavenly Father, we bless you in Jesus' name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this Glen and the Severn Shire, as it is in heaven. We speak to every household in the Glen and the Shire and say, we bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless your marriages that they may be strong and whole. We bless the partners in each household that the relationships between them may be loving, forgiving, merciful and strong. We bless every intergenerational relationship within each household that there may be peace, love and understanding flowing between each one. In Jesus' name, we bless every network of wholesome and supportive friendship. We bless your health, that you may be well and strong. In Jesus' name, we resist any sickness or disease which seeks to invade this shire. And to every person in the Glenanus Severn Shire, we say, be well, be strong, be healthy. To any who are sick right now, we say we bless you in the name of Jesus, with a speedy recovery. We bless your wealth, that you may have plenty to replace poverty. We bless you to have enough to live and enough to give. We bless the work of your hands, that whatever you turn your hand to, which is wholesome, may be profitable. We bless every wholesome enterprise that is conducted by you, that it may prosper and be successful. We bless the grass of the fields, that it may be strong and nutritious throughout the year. We bless the flocks and the herds, that they may be well and strong, and that they may multiply. We bless the cultivated land, that it may yield rich harvests. We bless the weather, that it may be good, and that the rain may be timely and regular. We bless our local schools, that they may be safe and secure places for teachers and pupils alike. And we bless the children in Jesus' name. We bless the Queen, the Prime Minister, the Premier, 
the Mayor, and their governments in Jesus' name, that they may govern with justice and righteousness, giving them courage to lead well, that we may live in peace and prosperity. We bless the nation of Israel in Jesus' name, and we declare peace for Jerusalem. We bless the churches and all the other places of worship in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit and the word of God may flow out from you in power. We bless the hearts of all who live in the Glen and the Severn Shire, that you may be quickened to hear and respond to the voice of the living God. We bless all who live and work here, that the overspill of the blessings of the presence of the kingdom of God may fall upon you. Amen. Thanks so much, Fran. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day to fathers. But also I want to suggest to you, and one of the things that's been playing on my mind this morning, it's, it's a celebration of father, fatherhood in general. It's a high calling. It's a great calling. It's a challenging calling. Um, but, but let's remember our dads, our granddads, but it's also a celebration of fatherhood. So happy Father's Day, um, and we bless you in Jesus' name. And so, for, so today we're going to continue on with what we've been talking about for the last... A um, little while it seems, and one of the things that just keeps um, playing on my mind and, and I've been thinking about and what does this actually mean for my life personally, um, we talked about um, loving God and loving other people last week and we learned about agape love or unconditional love and, and I want to explore that a little bit more this morning and what that looks like um, specifically in instances but also what that may look like genuinely in our lives um, as an overall ex expression of God's love for us. So we're going to be looking at that this morning, looking at agape love and what that means. But but this is from my heart and I've been kind of meditating on it. And, and, and for me, it's a working out of what this looks like and I'm reading the scriptures and see what it says about the scriptures and actually applying that to my own life. Um, and I don't know about you, but I'm God's just dealing with my heart in the midst of all this, and I hope he's doing the same with you. So as Fran said, I encourage you to have some paper and a pen or pens. And um, as, as I give the references, there's going to be quite a few references today of, of the scriptures. Um, and so I encourage you to write those down. And particularly if anything stands out to you, if the Holy Spirit highlights something to you, that you would write it down and then go back and um, meditate on that, mull on that, think about it more and more and what that means um, for your life relative to you. And we do believe that God will speak to you this morning in the midst of what's happening here. Um, so we thank you for joining <laughs> us and we know that God's intention is to bless you this morning and to speak to you as he's been speaking to us um, here as well. So last week we talked about and we learned about agape love and God's um, how God interacted with Pe uh, Peter and met Peter where he, where he was at. But also um, I, I think we learned that um, Peter wa was honest with Jesus. He said, oh, I love you with a fond affection, but I don't unconditionally love you. And Jesus met Peter with that. But I don't think Jesus' intention was to leave Peter there because his admonition to us was that we learn to love others and God as he does. And so that's the admonition for us. And so agape is his unconditional love. The question of whether or not something is good or bad, and you see this a lot in Christian circles and think, oh no, that's a good thing to do, that's a bad thing to do. And you can see it in the life of Jesus, how the, um, the, the religious leaders around him thought what he did was bad. You know, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and healed a guy who had a withered hand. And they thought, no, that's a bad thing to do. But, but, the, but the question with, with love, with unconditional love, it's not about good or bad, so to speak, or so much, but rather will it bring or lead to life, to God's life? Or does it lead to death and decay? That's the question. And so when Jesus healed a guy on the Sabbath, wasn't about a good or bad thing to do. Is this going to bring life? To this guy and to this situation. Yes, it was, and that's why he did it. 2 John 4 
6 says this, I can't tell you how happy I am to learn that many members of your congregation are diligent in living out the truth exactly as commanded by the Father. But permit me a reminder, friends, and this is not a new commandment, but simply a repetition of our original and basic charter that we love each other. Love means following his commandments and his unifying commandments. Commandment is that you conduct your lives in love. This is the first thing you heard and nothing has changed. And so we're going to look at that. What does that mean for you and I today? I find this exciting. I find this exhilarating. But at the same time, it kind of brings tears to my heart because there's so much more to move into. There's so much more to understand. There's, there's so much that we don't know yet. And that's the excitement of the journey. So we're going to look at the life of Jesus. We're going to look at some specific instances of agape love or God's unconditional love in action, if I, if I may. In Luke 18, 35 to 43, it says this, Jesus came to the outskirts of Jericho. A blind man was sitting beside the road asking for handouts. Now, just if you can use your imagination, just picture it. Perhaps it's a warm, sunny day. Perhaps there's wind blowing, perhaps there's dust around because people are walking around and there's a bustling crowd. Um, so just to, in, in kind of imagine the smells. And here's this guy, a blind man sitting beside the road asking for handouts. And when he heard the rustle of the crowd, he asked what's going on. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene is going by. He yelled, Jesus, son of David, Mercy, have mercy on me. Those ahead of Jesus told the man to shut up, but he only yelled all the louder. Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered him to be brought over. When he had come near, Jesus asked, what do you want from me? He said, Master, I want to see you again. Jesus said, go ahead, see you again. Your faith has saved and healed you. And the healing was instant. He looked up, seeing, and then followed Jesus, glorifying God. Everyone in the street joined in, shouting praise to God. That's, that's a demonstration of the unconditional love into that guy's life. Here's another instance. Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 to 22, or thereabouts. Just then a woman who had hemorrhaged for 12 years slipped in from behind and lightly touched his robe. She was thinking to herself, if I can just put a finger on his robe, I'll get well. The context of this passage is this, this woman has been bleeding for 12 years, has spent all her money on medical um, care and trying to get doctors to bring healing to her life to no avail. In fact, she, she, it, 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 it's cost her everything she had. And she thought to herself, if I, she showed, heard that Jesus was coming to town and she thought to herself, oh, like this is quite bold because she's breaking all the ceremonial and um, re religious taboos to do this. It, she, it says here, she was thinking of herself, if I can just put a finger on his robe, I'll get well. And when it happened, it said, um, Jesus turned, caught her at it. Then he reassured her, courage, daughter. You're, you took a risk of faith and now you're well. The woman was well from then on. Here's another one, a little bit different. John 3, sorry, John 8, 3 to 8. The religion scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They stood to her in plain sight of everyone and said, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses in the law gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down, wrote, it, wrote with his finger in the dirt. They kept at, it, at him, badgering him. He straightened up and said, The sinless one among you, go first. Throw the stone. And bending down again, he wrote some more in the dirt. And then it says, the, from, from the older to the younger, the crowd just dissipated. 
And he was left alone with the woman. And he said to her, I no longer condemn you. Go sin no more. Profound act of unconditional love. Here's another one, but this one's a little bit different too. And this is love too. This is God's unconditional love. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. It said, uh, Jesus is talking with the disciples and he's told them his intention is to go to Jerusalem. And he told them plainly that when I go to the Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over and killed. And that's what he says here. He says, then Jesus made it clear to his disciples that it was now necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, submit to an ordeal of suffering at the hands of the religious leaders, be killed, and then on the third day be raised up alive. Peter took him in hand, protesting, impossible master, that can never be. But Jesus didn't swerve. P Peter Get out of my way. Satan, get lost. You have no idea how God works. That's a pretty bold statement to say to one of his disciples. And, and I want to suggest that that's, that's Jesus demonstrating unconditional love to Peter. There's another instance in Peter's life, and, and in fact it would happen to all the disciples the night, um, the night before Jesus was crucified. Jesus said, all, all you guys are going to run away and desert me. No, 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 we're not, we're not, we're not. But they did. But Jesus spoke plainly. Jesus speaks plainly to us. And that's in his unconditional love for us. And you see that the scriptures, you know, in Matthew 25, there's all these woes where he's pronouncing judgment on town after town. And, um, and, and he was quite strong with, with the way he related to and the way he spoke to religious leaders sometimes, but it was never out of malice. It was never, never out of hatred. It was in order to bring life and wholeness to the people concerned. And there's heaps of other instances in the scriptures, particularly where you see in the life of Jesus and then in the book of Acts and further on in the, in the Bible, where, or in fact the whole story of the Bible, where God he, he has this, a relationship with humanity where he expresses unconditional love. Matthew 11 says this, Matthew 11, verse 4 and 5. Jesus replied, because um, John had sent his disciples saying, are you the one we should be looking, are you the Messiah, are you the one we should be looking for? And Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you, what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And you see, read the Gospels, read the story of Jesus, and you see all these expressions of, of unconditional love specifically for people in a specific time and place. And I know he's done it for me, and I know he's done it for you too, where he has broken into your world and expressed his unconditional love for you. He does it. He's still doing it. Specifically. But I want to encourage you to consider, and we're going to look at this today, that there, I reckon there's other aspects of this general expression of his agape love. Here's one, Matthew 9, 35. It says, Jesus went through all the town and villages, <laughs> teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. That's just what he genuinely did. It's a general expression of the loving kindness of God. Matthew 5, 45. This is another one. And, and he says, Jesus says, this talking about the Father, he said he causes his son, as in S-U-N, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's the general expression of God's unconditional love. Another one perhaps we're more familiar with. John 3, 16 to 18, it says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point, out, point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help and to put the world right again. And I want to suggest this morning, this is what he's inviting us into, something beyond ourselves, something far 
beyond our own strength and capacity, far, far more beyond our understanding and our previous way of life. And I want to suggest to you this morning that it's a learnt life. Come follow me, he said. Come and learn to do this. That's what he did with Peter. And Peter, Peter learned what the master was endeavouring to teach him. In Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 says this, Watch what God does, and then, then learn to do it. Like children who learn proper behaviour from their parents, mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him, learn a life of love. That's what he's inviting us into. When he says, come follow me, come be my disciples. It's interesting how he said um, that the earmark of a disciple of his is that they will love one another. Sorry, keep company with him, learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give us, to, sorry, to give everything of himself to us. And this is the admonition in, in, to the Ephesians. Love like that. Love like that. Again in Philippians, Paul says this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. I'm going to, re I'm going to read that one again. So this is my prayer, Paul saying, oh, this is my prayer for the Christians at Philippi, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. So the challenge is, and uh, follow, come follow me, is to learn to love as he loves us. To experience and to express agape, his love, unconditional love, to him and to everyone else as well. And I want us to consider that and think about that, that, that agape love is not just about learning to love other people well, it's learning to love God well too. And we're going to look at that this morning in the general aspects. So let's look, look at three attributes. Or you know, This is not a comprehensive study. This is just three things that I believe the Holy Spirit spoken to me about that I'm sharing with you. Let's look at three attributes or characteristics of agape or unconditional love. Perhaps what it may look like in a gen general sense. And the first one is generosity. I think unconditional love is generous. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. Generosity. And we're going to look at some examples of that, which I think express it. Exodus 36 verses 2 to 7 says this. This is when the children of Israel had crossed the Red Sea. They're in the, in, they're in the wilderness. They're traveling around, um, <coughs> learning how to live life differently. And, um, and, and God had given instructions for Moses to build a sanctuary so that God could, um, there would be a meeting place, a specific place where people could come and meet with God and, um, and do what was necessary in that relationship. And, um, and so Moses got this instruction. He got these plans of what to build and how to build it. And so they had to get the supplies from somewhere. So they put out a call to the children of Israel. Um, we need, um, particularly in this incident, we need precious metals and jewels in order to, to build this and wood. And it says they took from Moses all the offerings that the Israelites had brought for the work of constructing the temple. So they put out a call, an altar call, so to speak. We, we, we need this in order to build what we believe God's called us to do. And it says, They took from Moses all the offerings that the Israelites had brought for the work of constructing the sanctuary, 
the people kept on bringing in their free will offerings morning after morning. All the artisans who were at work making everything involved in constructing this sanctuary came one after another to Moses saying, the people are bringing more than enough for doing this work that God has commanded us to do. So Moses sent out orders through the camp. Men, women, no more offerings for building the for building of the sanctuary. <laughs> Moses sent out orders for men and women, no more offerings for building of the sanctuary. And the people were ordered to stop bringing offerings and there was plenty of material for all the work to be done and enough, more than enough. It seems to me that an expression of unconditional love, it seems to me that one of the very natures or one of the very core attributes of the kingdom of God and the person of God is generosity. Let's go, we're going to look at some more passages in Luke chapter 9, verses 5 to 10. This is another one. This is an individual expression. It said, when Jesus got to the tree, so Jesus had come to a town called Jericho, and there's a mass of people around him, and he's walking along the street, and he stops under this tree, and he says this. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your house. And Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Now, this guy, Zacchaeus, um, was a chief tax collector. So he was genuinely despised by the general public of Israel. And everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have getting cosy with this crook? Zacchaeus just stood there, a little stunned. He stammered apologetically. And then in, um, in Luke's version, it says, Master. And in other versions that talk about they went home and had a meal, but we don't, we've got, there's no mention of the conversation. We don't know what happened in the midst of it. But, but, but he says this, that all the same. He says, Master. I give away half my income to the poor. And if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. And Jesus said, today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham, for the son of man came to, to find and restore the lost. Here's Zacchaeus, here's Zacchaeus and it seems like um, what we're talking about, he had this, eruption of generosity just pouring out of his soul because of the goodness of God that had been poured into his soul. The, the response was his pouring out of generosity. It, it seems like he couldn't contain himself. This was exemplified later in the life of the church. It says in Acts 4, 32 to 35. This is after the church has been established. And it says, while the congregations of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind, they didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said, that's mine, you can't have it. They shared everything. The apostles gave powerful witness to the resurrection of Master Jesus and grace was on all of them. So it turned out that not a person among them was needy. Those who owned fields or houses sold them and brought the price of the sale to the apostles and made an offering of it. And the apostles then distributed it according to each person's need. An eruption of generosity. Furthermore, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 4, it says this. Talking about specific church. And it says, now friends, Paul's writing, I want to report on the, on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province, province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. Just get the picture here. I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in churches in the churches in the in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colours. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. 
They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford. How is that possible? Pleading, <laughs> pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. An eruption of generosity. And I want to suggest to you this morning that as we enter into and learn more and more of the unconditional love of God, I want to suggest that the tendency will be and an inclination will be that you will be um, invited to be more generous as the day goes by, as the days go by. I think it's a part of the kingdom of God. It's an expression of unconditional love or agape. And that flows into um, generosity. I want to suggest the second attribute that I see in, in that is an attitude of servanthood, in which I believe is love and generosity in action. Sorry, could you pass me the tissue, please? Love and generosity in action. That's what servanthood is. It's not a have to. Excuse me for a minute, sorry. John 13, 12 onwards to 17 says this, and this is shortened down a bit. It says, Jesus said, do you understand what I've done to you? And what, what he'd done is he just got down. This is the night uh, before his crucifixion. He's sitting around with the disciples and he takes off his outer robe, uh, wraps a towel around himself, and he goes and washes his disciples' feet. And then he said, do you understand what I've done to you? You address me as master and teacher, and rightly so. This is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. May I suggest that the kingdom of God is about servanthood. And you see it in the life of Jesus. He said, I, I came to do and to say only what I see the Father do and say. He, he laid down his life for your night. He laid down his life for the purposes of God and for the person of God. He washed his disciples' feet. And, and he says, I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. In his teaching, he says this in Matthew 5, 43 to 47. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. Because that's what you would think. I'm challenging that, he says. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring the best, sorry, let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the supple moves of prayer for then you are working out your true working out of your true selves, your God created selves. And I want to suggest to you, I'm going to stop there for a minute. I want to suggest to you that there's a time for a choice. Am I going to do it the way I used to do, or I'm going to move into what I believe God's what God would do in this instance, or what God's saying to me in this instant, and following in His teaching? Now, not 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 kidding yourself. This is not an easy thing to do at times. But he's inviting us in to learn to live life beyond ourselves. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created self. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone regardless, the good, the bad, the nice, and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anyone can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run of the mill sinner does that. Servanthood. So what does that look like? Here's a couple of examples. Exodus 23. He says, um, you know, servanthood and, and laying down your life and, and loving your enemy. He says in Exodus 23 verses 4 to 5, it says, if you find your enemy's ox or donkey loose, take it back to him. If you see the donkey of someone who hates you lying helpless under its load, don't walk off and leave it. Help it up.
Det håper jeg da. Here's another one of how we can practice servitude, how we can exhibit unconditional love and express that to other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 17 to 13. There's this issue in the Corinthian church of um, eating food offered to idols. And Paul says this, he says, Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, or no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I causes my brother or sister to fall, sorry, what I eat causes my brother and sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. <laughs> to me, as I read that and as I was reading that this week, that that am I willing to give up my rights for the betterment of other people? Am, am, am I am I going to be so hard pressed that I'm going to be right and true in this? And destroy other people in the process. Paul says, no, I'm not going to do that. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your, of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. That's how we can lay down our lives. That's sacrificial love in practice. Then Galatians 5, 13 to 15 says this, It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a simple sentence, single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of of true freedom. So generosity, servanthood, and the last one is, uh, the last point that particularly for me, and I want to, I want to still kind of broaden you, there's other aspects of this that you could be looking at as well, but these are the three that I've been meditating on and what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to say this morning. And the last one is, as I said before, is to learn to agape God. Agape love and unconditional love is not only just expressing it to others, which we're strongly encouraged to do in the scriptures, but it's expressing our unconditional love to God, the Father. I, I, I can't love God in my own strength the way that he is worthy of. And how do we do that? Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. So in the, in the Old Testament with the Ten Commandments, have no other gods before me. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Luke 10, 27. Jesus was asked a question. What's the most important law in the commandments? And Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. <clears throat> so we've been looking at a couple of examples of how we can love our neighbours, but we, this is one that I want to look at, how we can love God. And to me, this is the most apparent one in the Scriptures. 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23 says this. This is Samuel talking to King Saul. Um, and he says that, Saul and it says, then Samuel said, do you think all God wants are sacrifices, empty rituals just for show? He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing. Not staging a lavish religious production, 
Not doing what God tells you is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-importance around God is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Another version says, um, obedience is better than sacrifice. He, he wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is the thing, and then do what God tells you to do in the midst of that. And one, one of the things I want to suggest to you quite strongly, we've been talking about this over the last uh, period of time, is I want to encourage you to daily read your Bible. I believe God will speak to you more and more the more you do it. Daily read your Bible. Then you can understand how he thinks. Then you can understand how he feels on certain issues and situations. Read the Bible. Learn to think what he thinks. How he thinks. Jesus said it quite plainly. In John 14, 23, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. And Jesus repeats this message, anyone who loves you will obey me, will obey my teaching. And I want to suggest that's, the love, that's one of the love languages of God. If we want to love God and don't live a life of obedience to him, perhaps that says something. James, I was listening to James this week or reading James this week and James is, a, is, is the brother of Jesus and, and and, and he says this in James chapter 1, verses 22, um, 24 in that area. It says, Do not fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Act on what you hear. In other words, be obedient to the leading and 